Here we go. We're, we're doing it. Okay, welcome. Um, my name is Greg Newton. My partner is Donnie Jokum, and we are the co-founders of the Bureau of General Services Square Division. Um, the Bureau has been closed uh, since March 12th, and we're not sure when we're going to reopen. The center, the LGBT Community Center in Manhattan, is our home, um, and they are currently closed as well because of the pandemic. So we're not sure when we're going to be in the physical space again with you, but we are very, very much looking forward to that. And in the meantime, we've been having some virtual events, which have been really great. Um, and we've recorded them and posted them online. So we're going to do that with this event as well. Um, and we're super excited that this worked out. We've hosted Tom before uh, for the launch of Ghosts of St. Vincent uh, a while back. And then uh, we hosted Matthew before for Remind me the title of the book. Medi uh, Dream, Dream Closet, Meditations on Childhood Space. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we're happy to have you both back, even if it's in the virtual realm, not the physical. Um, but we're glad that the technology is allowing us to do this. So uh, thank you both for joining from Berlin and LA. <laughs> um, so I'm going to introduce uh, both Matthew and Tom, read their bios, and then I'm going to let them take it away. And at the end, we'll do some Q&A. If people want to uh, send us some questions in the chat function, we can read those aloud towards the end and have a bit of a back and forth. Okay. So let's get going. Matthew Burgess is an assistant professor at Brooklyn College. He is the author of a poetry collection, Slippers for Elsewhere, and three children's books, Enormous Smallness, A Story of E.E. E. Cummings, The Unbudgeable Curmudgeon, and the newly rele released Drawing on Walls, A Story of Keith Haring, uh, which we are talking about tonight. Uh, he has edited an anthology of visual art and writing titled Dream Closet, Meditations on Childhood Space, uh, which we did an event for at the Bureau a couple years ago, as well as a recent collection titled Spellbound, The Art of Teaching Poetry. More books are forthcoming, including The Bear and the Moon, Make Meatballs Sing, the Life and Art of Carita Kent, and Bird Boy. A poet in residence in New York City public schools since 2001, Matthew also serves as a contributing editor of Teachers and Writers magazine. And Mr. Eubanks, Tom Eubanks is the author of Ghosts of St. Vincent's, published in 2017 and launched at the Bureau. Uh, Ghosts memorializes the famed village hospital, now multi-million dollar condos, and details its roles, its role, oops, in New York City's history with an emphasis on the AIDS crisis. After 32 years in New York City, Tom now lives with his husband and two dogs in Southern California, where he is completing a novel about the East Village in 1988. So please put your hands together and clap for our clap very visually for our <laughs> our guests. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Greg and Donnie, for hosting us, and thank you, Tom, for being here. Um, and also, thank you, Nora, for putting me in touch with Tom. When Drawing on Walls was coming out, I wanted to find people who shared a love of Keith Haring, um, people who maybe had met him or uh, have loved his work. And so Nora gave me Tom's information and I reached out to Tom and um, with this incredible generosity, I received uh, a copy of his book, his beautiful, incredible memoir, um, Ghost of St. Vincent's, wrapped in a, uh, a Keith Haring, Patricia Field sleeve, um, something that he fashioned out of this fabric. Um, and it's so our kind of friendship has just started virtually and it's been such a pleasure. So thank you, Tom, for, for being here to help celebrate this book. Um, I want to start by just sharing an excerpt from the book. Um, it's a pretty long picture book. Picture books are generally about 32 pages and this one is about double that. And it's a biography, so it really seeks to tell the life story of Keith Haring from his early childhood till his death. And I'm gonna share an excerpt from his arrival in New York City um, and then towards the end of the book. 
So I, in a moment, I'm gonna should do a screen share and kind of lead you through some of these pages and uh, read you the text. And then, um, but it's not a story time, and I know that this this event is more of a conversation. But just to kind of ground the conversation, I thought I would share a little. And bit. You're not a drag queen. Exactly, it's not drag queen story hour tonight. I, I wish it were. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Um, if anyone's out there, please put me in touch with drag queen story hour. Okay, so let me just give this a shot. Um, hopefully, all of you can see this. And I should say right now that. I am the author of the book, and these beautiful illustrations are by my collaborator and now close friend, Josh Cochran. Um, more stories to follow. So what you see here is um, Keith, he's just looked at the exhibition of Pierre Leshinsky in Pittsburgh and decided that he it's time to move to New York. Um, so, I'm going to read to you a little bit. So this is the reading time where you just get to uh, pretend you're a kid and enjoy. Let me see if I can move this. Okay, inspired, Keith knew, Keith now knew what he had to do to find the intensity and freedom that he desired. Keith arrived in New York City and enrolled at the School of Visual Arts. He was 20 years old. One day he found rolls of paper that someone had tossed in the, into the gutter. He enrolled them in the studio at school and began making bigger and bigger paintings. Keith especially liked painting on the floor by the open door where the sunlight poured in. People passing on the street would stop to watch or talk with him about what he was making. Keith loved it. He didn't believe that some people understand art while others don't, or that art should be hidden away in galleries, museums, and private collections. Keith wanted to communicate with as many people as possible. The public has a right to art. Art is for everybody. The East Village was Keith's new neighborhood. With his friends, he formed Club 57, a local hangout in the basement of a church on St. Mark's Place. A few years later, when Keith was 23, he fell in love with a DJ named Juan DeBose. Keith listened to Juan's music while he drew and Juan cooked big meals in their tiny kitchen. Together, they were happy. Keith wasn't earning money from his paintings yet, so he worked as a bicycle messenger, a bartender at the Mud Club, sorry, a sandwich maker on 7th Avenue. These, these uh, windows are popping up in front of the text. Uh, and an art assistant in a Soho gallery. He even got a job picking wildflowers in New Jersey. But his favorite job ever was drawing with children at a daycare center in Brooklyn. There is nothing that makes me happier than making a child smile. With his artist friend, Fab Five Freddy, Keith walked through Alphabet City admiring all the graffiti. He loved the colors, the size, the fluid lines, and the blossoming of art on the streets where people could see and enjoy it. One night, while strolling down the street, King Street in the West Village, Keith heard the thump and beat of music and discovered Paradise Garage. He was mesmerized by the dancers spinning on their heads and doing the electric boogie as disco and hip hop rocked the room. For Keith, drawing and painting were like dancing. He called it mind to hand flow. One day in the subway, Keith noticed blank panels where advertisements used to be. Suddenly, he zipped up to the street, bought a box of white chalk, dashed back downstairs, and began drawing on the walls. People paused as they rushed from here to there. For Keith, this was what art was all about, the moment when people see it and respond. Maybe it makes them smile, maybe it makes them think, maybe it inspires them to draw or dance or write or sing. When Keith was 24, he was offered a major one-man show at the Tony Schifrazi Gallery in Soho. The opening was packed with artists, musicians, celebrities, and friends, and Keith's family came all the way from Cutstown to celebrate. Keith's life as an artist was taking off. But no matter how busy he became or where in the world he went, he always made time for children. Keith understood kids, and they understood him. There was an unspoken bond between them. And since children often asked him to draw on their t-shirts, skateboards, and jeans, 
He always kept a black marker handy. The kid from Cutstown who longed to draw on the walls was now receiving invitations to paint murals all over the world. He was invited to West Germany to paint a stretch of the Berlin Wall, which had been built to divide people, even family and friends, and keep them apart. Keith believed in the unity of all human beings, so he painted a long chain of interconnected figures. He also painted a wall with 500 high school students in Chicago, Illinois. It was his longest mural ever at 488 feet, and it took five days to complete. To honor him, then Mayor Daley declared it Keith Herring Week. After watching Keith work, a kid came up to him and said, I can tell by the way you paint that you really love life. And Keith did love life every single day, no matter what difficult difficulties came his way. Even when he learned that he had a serious illness called AIDS, Keith didn't stop making art and sharing his gifts with the world. He was overwhelmed by sadness at first, but then he decided that he would live each day fully as if it were his last. I appreciate everything that has happened, especially the gift of life I was given that has created a silent bond between me and children. Children can sense this thing in me. So I'm gonna leave off there. This is just a sort of passage in the middle of the book. And um, I, I guess I chose that passage because it's centered in New York and, um, and also because it sort of demonstrates that with this book, it was really important to be as open and candid as I felt that Keith would want a book about himself to be. Um, and that it was exciting to make this book with my publisher, Enchanted Lion, because we shared that vision that, that it was time to make a children's book that was daring and bold and candid. Um, and I guess what I wanna sort of share right now before, we, um, before I turn it over to Tom is in August of 1989, Keith, uh, was on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. And he came out in uh, this very outspoken way, very impressive way that made a huge impression. And um, he said, this is an excerpt from that, from that interview. He said, to me, one of the most important things is that being sick is not going to make me go back on anything in my life. I don't regret anything I've ever done. I wouldn't change anything. Everything was natural and out in the open. I think one of the hardest things AIDS has done is to kids growing up now, trying to figure out their sexuality in an unbiased way. They always will have their sexuality shoved down their throats, but they'll make their own way because it's such a strong thing. It will override everything, no matter how much brainwashing is going on. So imagine how horrible it must be to some young kid who knows he's gay or someone thinking of experimenting. They could have a sentence of death. It's horribly frightening. It gives so much fuel to the people who are telling you that it's wrong to be who you are. There are so few people who are openly, good openly gay role models or just good people who are respected who are open about their sexuality. Now there has to be openness about all these issues. And I think for maybe a lot of people who are just coming up now, young people, it would be hard to imagine um, what that was like in 1989. And so Tom, I kind of, I guess I wanted to, ask you like, what did that feel like? What did that mean uh, to encounter that interview, to hear those words or read that interview in 1989? Um, it, was, it, was, it was pretty groundbreaking. Although a lot of people, um, a lot of you know, bold, bold faced names had, had succumbed to AIDS. Um, and in the obituaries, there was always something else. You know, it, was, it was a heart attack or a pneumonia. It was never really AIDS. They never really threw that down. Um, so for him to just come out and say, in August of 1989, which was a terrifying time for this, um, you know, I'm positive and in Rolling Stone and just come out. And then the thing is, what was really more impactful was that he, 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 he wasn't just words. He went out to, you know, he was very, very instrumental in ACT UP and creating, you know, a lot of their, um, a lot of their materials, you know, a lot of the art for them. Um, but the thing is that was really interesting about that was, um, was um, it kind of, you know, we didn't know that he was diagnosed in 88. And there was this whole thing in 86 when he started the pop shop, there was kind of this, 
you know, back then there was, there was this whole thing about selling out. And so there was a little bit of, you know, as much as we admired him, there was still a little bit of this sellout feeling. We, wasn't, we weren't really quite sure yet what the pop shop was all about. And, you know, we, we weren't aware that he was really trying to spread things. We were thinking he's trying to make money. Because the village voice was like, the pop shop is bad. And us as 19, 20 year olds were like, oh, the pop shop's bad. So like when this happened later, it just made him, um, it just kind of made him one of us. It just made him, uh, it was just, it was a really brave moment. And uh, um, it just kind of took all that away and just made him much more uh, important to us. Mm -hmm. you know, and we revered him for that. We and this, it. like, when you talk about we and us, who, do, who does that encompass? I guess I guess I just the, those of us that came from like the, the places like the cuts towns of the world, you know, the lovely white yeah. suburbs, we all came to New York. You know, those of us like me who, you know, came from these places to do what Keith did. We all came to New York to meet people who weren't like us, you know, to, 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 to expand our horizons, to, to explore creativity. And so in that way, he was such an inspiration because he came here, he did it, he painted on the scene, he drew things in the subway and then was, you know, a major star. So for us, he was, he was, he was, he was I, and that's why I say, you know, for us, because um, now he represents so much more, but for us then it was just, he was this, uh, I mean, just little things like he would send her in an interview magazine. He had said that uh, they talked about his style and he said, you know, I, I don't like to wear things I can get in New York. You know, I only wear things I get outside of New York. And I just thought that was the coolest thing. I was like, of course. Yeah, you got to get things out. That's, that's cool. That's it because everyone can get it here in New York. And now with the internet, everybody can get everything anywhere. So it does. So that whole di distinction between being in New York, the bohemia of New York. And so that's changed. But at the time it was very important. So he was kind of one of the kings, you know, holding that. Were you like aware of him when you first came to New York? Was his, was his oh, yeah. presence here yeah. that you were aware of? Yeah, I got here in 85, so he had really taken off. 83 was really when he really started to, to escalate. So he was still doing things in the subway, but mostly he was traveling the world and doing all kinds of amazing murals and, and things at that point. But, um, so it was really just mostly the way all of us were, you know, just, uh, you know, with the pop shop and with interviews and just constantly in the press, constantly in the media. It was just a, you know, constant presence. And we'd see him out, but not as often, you know, as, as maybe he went out you know, earlier than that, but we'd see him out and about. I sent you that picture that I took of him. Right, and, right. Uh, yeah. And did you see the subway drawings? I mean, there, I, I don't remember really seeing them, but there was, um, I, in 85, I was lucky enough to, to go to a, uh, area for Andy Warhol's 15-minute uh, party because he was doing this thing on MTV called the 15 minutes. It was, you know, 15 minutes of fame show. Right. Um, and so the party area, and in the in the you know in the front they had this vending machine, and you could put quarters in. And I got um, a little envelope, and inside were uh, these black a black sheet that had been torn with the chalk drawing. So it was a chalk drawing that had been you know torn up and sold to this vending machine. And I and I wish I still had it. I don't I don't have that. Do you remember having an encounter with Keith's work before you came to New York? Like, how do you think, because this was before the internet, right? So how, did, how was he on your radar? Through museums and through like Interview Magazine and through the Village Voice and just through all those things that, you know, that those of us who were keen to come to New York or were just infiltrating New York, that's, you know, that's how we would get it. And he was just, you know, kind of the king of New York at that time, especially, I was in the East Village in the, you know, in the 80s and that's just, right. he was the king. Yeah, so. Because I was so, trying to backtrack and think about what my early encounters were of his work. And, um, and really, it just was so different before the internet became ubiquitous, because how would we find these like queer signals in the how, environment? So how did you find his stuff before the internet? That's, where did you find his stuff? Well, it's hard to know exactly, but I just remember staring at the cover of A Very Special Christmas, um, that CD with like Whitney Houston was on it, The Pointer Sisters, Bruce Springsteen. Um, and he did the cover. Religious, so it, was, it was a mother and child, right? Was, right, and that's what's kind of fascinating is that it was, you're nodding your head, um, Greg and Donnie, you like, I mean, it was a religious, it was religious image, it was a nativity scene, but there was something about the style that called out to me. And I just remember staring at it and just being drawn to that, to the style of it and feeling a certain affinity for it, but I didn't, I wasn't aware exactly of why. It was, I guess, an energy that it sort of transmitted or just a did feeling you, of it did being- Did you then seek him out then? Did you seek his workout or was it something later that you came across? Yeah, and I think, I think we saw it on MTV, right? Um, in Grace Jones videos and, and elsewhere. And um, when I first came to New York, my first time in New York was in 93, the spring of 93, and I made the pilgrimage to the pop shop. And, um, 
and um, you know, bought some things, um, including like some flip books that I still have that I carried with me from apartment to apartment. Um, but I was kind of imitating his work in high school. I was like drawing Keith Haring inspired, um, you know, doodles. And also like, I have a couple ceramics that I still have that have like a very obviously inspired by Keith Haring. Um, but really, I think the moment <clears throat> when I was blown away was in 2012 at the Brooklyn Museum retrospective. Yeah. So I'd been a fan my whole life. Were you, did you see that show? That yeah, was an amazing show, yeah. It was huge. It was an incredible show. And I think um, I encourage anyone who has, who's a, who you know, is a fan of Keith Haring or who likes his work, but there's something about seeing it in person and encountering that work um, you know, a on a large scale or on the wall and really seeing, seeing, all those, seeing all those icons together in one room like that. It's just right. And also something is transmitted by the line, right? The, the, the spontaneity, the swagger, like the confidence of his line. When you look at a large piece and you see the dripping paint, it really gives you a sense of how spontaneously these things were created. And it's funny you say that because the thing is, I think he has swagger in his journals as well. Like he wasn't just an incredible painter with the line. His journals are pretty amazing on their own. Um, and I know that you quote a bit from them in the book. So did, they must mean something to you. Right. So and when I was... You have a copy in Germany with you, right? Aren't you carrying it with you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this book, um, when I went to the, the retrospective at the Brooklyn Museum, I, um, I had one of those museum moments where you like, you want to start making something. I mean, you really like there's, you're looking at art on the wall and it really stirs you up. And uh, I walked into the bookshop and had one of those moments where I just cracked the book and I cracked it to this page where he starts talking about his relationship with kids. Um, and I had been teaching poetry in New York City public schools for about a decade at that point. And he speaks so intelligently about children, um, not in any kind of Pollyanna way at all. It's like he really understood kids and respected their intelligence and their imagination. And so I think the journals, um, two things. One, you hear his voice. And so if you just know him from his work, it's so different to read the journals and understand how deeply he thought about what he was doing, how deeply he understood what he was doing. And also how incredibly intelligent he was and insightful. Like, he's a really good writer. Yes, he was a very good writer. How did the, what was the impact of the journals? When did you first encounter them? Um, I, I read them, uh, I mean, I read them from time to time. Um, I can't even think of the first time I read them. Um, this is something I always had and I always dip into now and then. Um, I, just, uh, just amazing. The journals. And you carry them, you have sort of bring them with you from place to yeah, place. Yeah, they're box now. I'm moving, but, they're, but they are in a box. But yeah, definitely the whole time. The, the, uh, the, the visual journals, so I actually have that, his, his visual journals with um, like his early ones are also pretty amazing. Did I go out? Now you're back. Oh, they're back? Um, yeah, I think uh one of the things about the journals that really struck me is when he's articulating his connection with kids um it made me think that you know this biography that i've written is not just like about an artist for the sake of writing about an artist that i like but it really feels like a, like almost a, a continuation of his wishes because he's one of the things he says is on the back of the book um and this is he says, whatever else I am, I'm sure I at least have been a good companion to a lot of children and maybe have touched their lives in a way that will be passed on through time. Um, so this kind of understanding of kids is a little bit unusual among artists. I mean, and he, he recognized that, but that's not, that's not something that um, is all that common. And it, he was kind of like one of those, like um, Francesco Clemente, I think we talked about this earlier, always said, he's only friends with me because of my kids because he really just wanted to be around his kids all the time. And there's another great story I love where Andy Warhol and Keith Haring um, met Sean Lennon and Yoko Ono. And Sean Lennon was way more into what Keith was doing than what Andy was into. And it was, it really pissed Andy Warhol off. Right <laughs> really funny story. Um, but it's just, he had that, he just had that thing with kids. And I think it's also because he, for his, his, uh, his younger sister, you know, when he was, I don't know, 12 or so, or 10, I guess. But he, mm -hmm. he took care of her, he basically babysat her. 
and I think they had such a strong connection. I just curious. Plus, he was a kid too. There's, you know, you can't read anything about him without someone saying what, how childlike he was, what a kid he was. You know, apple pie, Kutztown. You know, all those things. It's just he was just a kid at heart. As yeah, as and I don't think um, people who just know his work casually don't know that how much time he made for kids. So basically, you know, he was traveling all over the world, and almost everywhere he went, he would for free either do a mural for children, like the Children's Hospital in France, or he would um, collaborate with someone locally to do workshops, to do drawing workshops. Like one of the things he would do is roll out a big um, scroll of paper and play music. And so all the kids would sit around and they would draw, and then he would say stop or turn off the music and everyone would sort of like jump to another uh, chair, kind of musical chairs with, with drawing. Um, so it was really, it was really an incredible commitment to be making so much art for free and for children. I mean, really like carving out this time to work with them, which really goes against that idea that he was somehow selling out with the pop shop. Right. And that's, and that's, and that's what, that's how I was challenged and how a lot of us were challenged later with that because he kind of changed art that way. He said, you know, screw you to the galleries. And he said, I'm going to do it this way. I'm not going to go that way. I'm going to go this way, you know? And it was amazing and it was really brave. But at the time, it seemed like, you know, in the 80s, it was, you know, yuppie, go home, it was all that. So to us, it was a sellout. But as time went on, we realized, oh, that was his way of getting his art to the public, getting it out through, you know, without having to deal with Shafrazi and all those people and sell his work for tons of money, you know, just come in and get a button and you got my art, you know? Right. It was amazing. It was a democratic way of. And that's something you really get in the journals is like from a very young age, he was in deeply interested in how to connect with the public. And the pop shop was an outgrowth of that desire to bypass the art establishment, to bypass museums and galleries and reach people. Um, there's this, when he was in Pittsburgh, there's this uh, description in the John Gruen authorized biography where he talks about seeing Christo's running fence. So Christo came and spoke and he was attending this conference and he describes like the reaction of these farmers who woke up in the middle of the night or in the, you know, at sunrise to see um, his piece, The Running Fence. So I'm gonna read that passage really quick. <clears throat> he writes, um, during my last year in Pittsburgh, there was one other really important thing that occurred and that was my hearing a lecture given by the artist Christo. After the lecture, he showed a film about one of his works called Running Fence. It affected me profoundly. It fulfilled all of the philosophical and theoretical ideas I had about public art and about the intervention of an artist with the public and with real events. I mean, to see these people, these farmers who resisted Christo's project getting up early in the morning to see the sunrise reflected in the running fence and standing there and saying it was the most beautiful thing they'd ever seen. I mean, totally transforming these people who were farmers and seeing them affected and challenged by and inspired by a work of art. No matter how contemporary it was and no matter how alien it was to everything they knew, somehow that forced intervention by an artist made them see things in a whole other way. And he says, well, it impressed me incredibly. So you can see how this young artist who has this incredible desire to connect with people, um, how the subway chalk drawings were like just this incredible discovery for him. That was like kind of when the lights went on for him is he's like, oh, this is, this is how I'm going to do it. Um, I mean, and as, as, and, and as he did it in the practicality of doing it, you know, he would, he would get arrested by the police or he'd have to look over his shoulder. So that, that, that established the quickness of the line and him doing it and getting out of the way. You know, so and, a lot of time doing something, just get in, get out. Totally, and also the idea that the, um, the act of making is, is a sacred performance. And that, yeah. right, that, that it was not just about the finished product. And you know, so many of his pieces are untitled that it's, it, for him, it was really about um, the moment of making. And so many people who watched him, and I wonder if anyone, in the, in, anyone here tonight um, actually watched him work. Uh, I would love to hear a story about um, watching him work because um, people describe like the fact that there was no false move, right? That he would sort of approach the wall with no prior sketches and just immerse himself in the act of making it. And then when he was finished, take a step back and it was finished. 
So it was so much of it was about that immersive act of making and of invite. And this is the other thing, like inviting people into that performance or inviting people into that moment of being able to witness it. That's what and, I was going to do. And also inviting people in to participate with him. The whole the Bill T. Jones piece that he did was very performative. It was very improv, improv it was improvisational. You know, it, it, if you see me when you watch it, um, you know, Bill moving in the foreground and then Keith sketching in the background and they, there's no music and it's just them working together, you know, creating this piece that's just amazing. It was very performative as well. Yeah, so spontaneous and so confident. And I think that's part of what you feel when you see it in person, is you feel um, the energy that with which he approached his, his art, you can kind of feel it. And I can't help but think, and you educating children, you could probably answer this, something like this. Um, I'm just thinking like, do you think he was so assured because he had such as, so that his parents were, because I mean, when, when you see his parents in interviews and things, it just, everything just seemed very, um, uh, I don't know how to say it, just, just everything was, um, it was very picturesque and he just seemed very taken care of and everything was, and he was supported and it just didn't seem like he had no doubts or, or no shame. I'm just wondering where that came from. Do you think that was kind of in him or do you think that maybe came from his environment? You know that, that attitude, thing. that swagger we're talking about, where that swagger came from because it's just so, and I can only think maybe the stability of his childhood or? Yeah, I, it's funny enough, I kind of, I think, um, I think it might have something to do with some of his drug experiences, actually. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. I mean, I think his, ex his experimentation with, um, and I'm assuming this, this, is geared for, this is geared for grown-ups, right? This, this yeah, event is geared for grown-ups. Yes. Um, his, time, his time spent with Timothy Leary, right? That's what you're talking about? Yeah, and I think he just had some really profound moments where it became very clear that this is what he wanted to do, and this is what he was here to do. Um, and he describes those experiences um i think in his journals and it just feels like something clicked for him so i wouldn't i'm not like attributing it to those experiences but they were profound yeah, for him. that helped also helped open him up to right right that certainty that, yeah. there's a um i start the book um with two epigraphs um and one of them is by timothy leary and it says he's there painting on walls and running around the world and kids flock to watch him do it the intensity, the way he approaches a wall with total openness is the way he approaches you. Keith is in the best sense of the world, childlike, open. Again, there's that childlike open, yeah, everyone throws that out. So something I wanna ask you, like I see your shirt, I see the picture in the background and like, can you talk about what your like connection is with Keith? Like what do you, what do you think, um, how, do you, how do you speak to this very obvious connection that you have, what is it about? I, 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 I really don't know what it is. It's just something that I always felt. Um, and the book, I'm working on a book now where, where the, one of the protagonists is, is roughly based on Keith. It's kind of a Keith, Robert Maplethorpe mix up of, a, of an artist um, who's dealing with AIDS. And, um, and, it's, and it's something that I started back in, you know, 1989, 1990. And I'm realizing since we've been talking about this that I think I started it right after his death. I think that it was just something about him that was so, like I said, um, coming from where I came from and coming to New York, you know, I had the dream that he had, which was to come to New York and to be something, to make something of myself. So, right. so he was so inspiring that way. And he did it. And, um, and then he died. And it was, and the thing is, we could talk about Keith, but the thing is, what's so amazing to me about Keith's career and life and stuff was that he was only in New York for 12 years. Mm -hmm. He moved there in 1978 and he died in 1990. So that's, so what we're talking about really is about 12 years worth of just, things just, I mean, so much, he was so prolific, you know, and I think that when he found out that he was positive in 88, um, I, there was a critic who, who referred to it as like when Beethoven discovered he was going deaf, he just said, I've got to do everything I can do right now. And I think editorializing a bit, that might have run him down at the end, if he had not been trying to do everything, paint the thing in Pisa, go to the BMW in Germany, come back and do Once Upon a Time at the center. You know, he was running, doing, painting, using toxic materials. Maybe he would have been here today. He would have been 62, you know, today. And he should be here. It's you know? incredible that he did all that essentially in his 20s. Yeah. Like, what and, and then, then, then we Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just, 
And I guess a lot of us had that reckoning then when he did die in 1990, because he came, you know, because it was 89, he said, okay, I'm positive. And we we're all like, okay. And then 90, six months later, he died after that announcement. So it was really just, I mean, there were deaths all around, but his, for me, just struck a real chord. Like, you've got to do, you've got to do stuff, you've got to. When you wrote to me, you said, you described Keith as being totally accessible and free of the ego, free of self-censorship. So is it, was his like honesty and candor, is that part of, do you think, why you feel this bond or why you feel? So yeah, because the thing is I still had, I mean, I think all of us still had shame. We came to New York and as out and as open as we were, um, I still wasn't able to express myself the way he did. You know what I mean? He just really just, it's just, it's incredible how he just did not, he didn't censor himself or say, oh, I can't draw a bunch of dicks. I can't do that. That's sorry. Right. Kids. You know, I just, you know, but, but he did. And he was just, and it was part of his way to say to the world, look, this is who I am. I'm gay. This is the eighties. No one did that. No one, I mean, very few people did that. You know, right. this is who I am. I am gay. Everybody look at me. This right. is, you know, and that was, that was just, that was incredible. He and I, I was reading this quote by um, Roy Lichtenstein and it was basically talking about like how Keith's representations of sensuality, eroticism and sex was like happy. Like there's something in his depictions of sexual energy that doesn't feel even remotely pornographic. It feels celebratory. Right, 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 right. And I think that like the I, representation, that like visual image of sex as being celebratory and like energetic and fun was striking. And I don't, I don't remember seeing well, that anymore. Especially during a pandemic where sex could kill you. Yeah, right. because he was doing this 81 through, you know, and 81 was when we found out that this was happening. So he was just like, screw it. I'm like, you know, it just, it was, it was amazing. And he persisted in creating this imagery even after his diagnosis that, that had this kind of like insistence upon depicting sex as being celebratory. I think in his journals, one, in somewhere he does say that sex is more important to me than art. It is more, it is more, it is, it is a, it is a, it's something it's a bigger spark, I think he says, than art is to me, his sexuality. So your, your shirt right now, like, were, were you involved in ACT UP at all? It's, it's funny, and, and, and this is, this is, I, it, when I've, I've been looking at a lot of things, and John Sex, or someone says something about that, where, um, or not John Sex, or he was already here, but people came to New York, you know, looking for Andy Warhol. I think it's Kenny Sharp said that, you know, we all wanted to come to New York and meet any in the world. And that's kind of how I was and the people that I came to New York with and knew here. But when we got here, we got AIDS. And we, so it was kind of, so I, I respected ACT UP and I, and, I, and I did go to some meetings, but there was, for me at the age I was and for why I came to New York and as, um, as irresponsible I wanted to be, it, it, it wasn't a place where I could be. There's, there's, to me, there was too much anger. There was... Um, I did. I worked for Outweek magazine, so I did go to some some demonstrations, and I and I did work for the cause. But to go to those sweaty, angry meetings down in the center just were a little too much for me. I wanted to be out partying. So right, right, right. It was, yeah. But you're you, you appreciate him as a like an activist. I mean, is yes. that part of what you admire? I'm just looking at your T-shirt. Yeah, no, yeah, and then also because it wasn't, you know, just him, him dedicating to the cause. You know, he he created all these things for ACT UP, and he did these things for the Special Olympics. You know, he did things just openly, and you know, just just from his heart. You know, right. not to make any money or not to do anything. Just so that's why I just revered him. Um, I want to leave a little bit of time for question and answer, or for anyone to tell any Keith stories who's here. Um, but I thought maybe we might end with that poem that you sent me by Tim Dlugos. Oh, the Tim Dlugos poem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You want to read it? Shall I read it? So you read it. Show that. Do you have the book? Or are you reading it from the book? Or are you reading it from the page? Yeah, here's the book, the Tim Dlugos, um, A Fast Life, Collected Poems. Great book. And this is a poem that, uh, that Tim wrote. Actually, it's dated, uh, dated February 16th, 1990. Um, and it's called Radiant Child for Keith Haring. A baby in a desert boom town wears a t-shirt on which is an image of the radiant child. The infant is no longer, is no larger than a young man's hand, the generous hand of the artist who died this afternoon. By the time she's old enough to crawl like the child in the drawing, his hand will wear a coat of dust or long ago have been reduced to ash. Ashley Noel Snow, my lover's niece, a brand new life in a t-shirt from the pop shop in a snapshot he would have loved to see. And that's dated February 16th, 1990, which is the day that Keith died. So, talk about talismans. Beautiful. 
Yeah, absolutely. And it, you know, and it, it talks about his connection with kids too, which is so amazing. Yeah. Um, Cause it was always there. There was always that, you know, people always talked about it. You know? We, I don't know if we've talked about this yet here with everyone, but um, we were talking earlier about the talismanic quality of Keith drawings, buttons, stickers. Um, and, you know, when he, he became friends with Brian Geisen and William Burroughs. And it, that was a moment for him when he kind of connected with this, like what he called like a brothership, a, bro a brotherhood of, of, of a gay brotherhood. Um, and sort of connecting with this tradition. Um, and I just see him as such a strong example of someone who, for whom a lot of people, he provides that kind of encouragement. Um, just earlier today, I was, I met an illustrator um, for the first time, young gay illustrator who, without even my prompting described opening up Keith Haring's journals, finding a quote that he then you know, wrote out and carried around in his wallet. Um, so I'm just interested in how Keith Haring's imagery and how his persona and how his writing kind of is something that you carry with you. It's something that emboldens you or encourages you or um gives you a kind of strength in some way and you have the tattoo which i don't think you've shown yeah i mean i have this tattoo um i'm not the only one there's uh someone named alex fialho who has one and so does his mother which is very cool um <laughs> and i met them just I, you know i met him and we both had to have it it's just very cool random um uh, but um you're asking about the talisman what was the, sorry yeah, I was just asking. Yeah, if that if, that, if you connected. I mean, the reason he inspires me now is because because I'm writing this character that's that's very similar to him. But um, I would say that, that I mean that's always kind of been this thing about him. There's this interesting story that Yoko Ono tells. Have you heard it at all? But she went to his cremation, yes. and somebody gave her a, gave her a knuckle bone, Keith's knuckle bone. And she took it with her. She didn't know why. She figured, oh, it'll come in handy at some point. I'll just take it with me. And then she said that his spirit spoke to her and said, take me to Paris. So yeah. She got on a plane, flew to Paris, stayed at the Ritz, and then out in front of the, at the Cologne Vendôme, right. she, you know, he said, oh, put my, put my knuckle bone at the base of the statue. So she did, and she left it there. It's just, she tells a story, it's amazing because he does have that effect on people. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that, that, that there was yeah, something kind of sacred about him. Right. Without getting way too hagiographic. Right, without getting too boo but was, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, and the, the dying young thing, I mean, all of that just kind of compounds it. It just makes it, you know, because I mean, it's just, if he was 60, if he lived today, what would he be doing? You know, he would still be inventing and creating. I mean, just can you imagine where his stuff would have gone? So before, before we pivot, um, there's a, the cover of a German magazine. I'm in Berlin right now is um, this monopole magazine. He's on the June cover. So he's still like, he's still on the cover of magazines in the, the article. Um, this is this like pretty incredible series of pages with lots of beautiful images, but it's basically the translation. The like, That's the pop shop there. Yep. Yeah. And the, the transition is like even more now. Um, so it's just this, this like idea of him be his work and his presence being even more resonant now than ever. Yeah. What do you, how do you think, like what, I guess we can also open that up. Like how do we account for that? Why is he so present now? We have, uh, we have a couple of questions. Great. If I may. So we have one from Nora asking, can either of you talk about how inclusive Keith was in terms of race? Um, and Matthew, can you tell us what the response has been to your book from kids? Oh my gosh. Well, I'll talk to the to that question. Um, one of the best things is to get pictures of people with their kids uh, reading the book. And just getting that sense of it actually circulating. Because for me, I, there was nothing like this growing up. I mean, it was really hard to find any positive representations of, of gay people anywhere. Um, and so the idea that this book is circulating and um, hopefully like maybe being that like little light for people is exciting. Also, a lot of kids have pictures where they're drawing so the idea that like reading the book activated them creatively and made them want to immediately start drawing. So I have all these pictures of the book right here. And then yeah, there are these like 
really adorable portraits of Keith or um, their own kind of creative expression right beside the book. So, so far it's been great. The reception's been wonderful. That's great. That's great to hear. Do either of you want to talk about the first question? How? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, um, yeah, it's 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 a good question. Um, and I, um, the, 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 I guess what I'm dealing with also in the book is is um, is uh, his attraction to to black and brown people and his work with them and and all that. And I guess it's um, it's for uh, it's definitely for someone else to to discuss these days in this climate, but I'm just saying that I think that um, what's most interesting about his stuff, uh, I, 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 I mean, no, forget it. Sorry. I just, uh, sorry. That's okay. Um, Tyler uh, would love to hear thoughts on how today's mainstream branding of herring often neglects political commentary, South African apartheid, AIDS, sex positivity, drug epidemics, et cetera. Your mm -hmm. thoughts on the, that? Well, as somebody who tried to get an AIDS book published, I mean, it, that doesn't sell. So if you put that stuff out there, I mean, that's just the, the crude, the, you know, is people aren't gonna put that stuff out there because no one's gonna buy that stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I will say that um, I think, you know, I read this passage earlier from the book and, I'm not saying it would be impossible, but it would be difficult to create this book, I think, with um, a less adventurous publisher. Like, I definitely think that because I worked with Claudia at Enchanted Lion, who sort of shared the vision that this is the story we want to tell, that one is, that, that is as, that sort of answers his call in 1989 of insisting upon greater openness. So the, a lot of people in the industry, I think, would say like, ooh, you know, not such a good idea to uh, mention homosexuality or mention hey, AIDS hey, diagnosis. It's in a children's book. It's not that right, awesome. right. Like this idea that you have to protect kids from that or that it's too heavy. Um, and I think that, you know, kids, young people are, it's important. I think it's, it's important in part to answer the call that Keith like very explicitly made. And also kids are aware of what's going on. I mean, young people are, absorbing this and so the idea of not talking about it and trying to wall them off to it is just a bad call um, now in terms of the marketing i mean this, i'm not totally answering the question i think um hopefully people who feel that connection to his work it's sort of a click or two away to find the rest of his body of work you know what i mean so like i'm glad that he's so present and the way that it sort of feels sanitized i'm not thrilled about, but it's so kind of easy to pivot online and to find more depth in his work. And uh, Professor Burgess, you are, you have, <laughs> Jordan would like to say hello. And uh, since New York City has become increasingly gentrified and commercialized, do you think Keith or artists like Keith would thrive in New York City today? Why or why not? Mm -hmm. Jordan, I'm so glad you're here. I can't see you, but I'm really <laughs> for being here, Jordan. Um, I think, I don't know how to answer that question. I think it's definitely harder, and I think um, it's just hard to survive here. I mean, Keith and his friends, and I mean, Tom, you could speak to this, that you could kind of scrape together a living. There's this spread in the book where it's like he, he picked wildflowers in New Jersey, and he made sandwiches and he was a busboy at Danceteria. So you could, it was easier, I think, to pay the rent. Absolutely. There's no question about that. Um, sometimes I think that it's just Manhattan, it's not happening in Manhattan, but it's maybe a little easier outside of it. Even that sort of unrealistic rents are so high. Tom, what do you think about that? I mean, you moved away recently. Yeah, and the Bohemian Fringe left you know, shortly after Keith did. That was, that was, I mean, things just started getting pushed out, pushed out, pushed out into the boroughs. And then finally, and I guess with the internet too, it just made that irrelevant because when I was that age, when Keith was that age, and we would go to New York to find our people. But now kids, I think, can go online and find their people. They don't necessarily, and with the pandemic, I mean, they can't be moving other places. So, but the thing is with, I mean, New York was the place where you'd go and find the people that you were meant to find. And I think now people do that online more than they do in physical spaces. I may be wrong, but that's what it seems like to me. Jordan, where are you living right now? 
Can she unmute herself? Maybe I, I don't want to embarrass you. Oh, hey, Professor Burgess. Hi, Jordan. Hi, um, you know me, born and raised in Brooklyn. I'm still in Brooklyn. <laughs> nice. Well, you're teaching right now, right? You're a school teacher. Yeah. And also, you just got your first book deal. Yeah. <laughs> well, congratulations. That's great. Thank you. Congrats. And we have a question from Alex. Hey, guys. Congratulations on the book. I'm really happy to hear you both in conversation. Um, one thing that I'm thinking out loud about, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts is, I mean, I think I'm ref it's helping me reflect back to when I was a child, I actually thought AIDS was called AIDS because people had medical AIDS come to their bedside a lot. Like I just, you know, I was a child. I had no reference to why something would be called that. And that was just the, I don't know how that came in my brain, but it came in my brain and that stuck with me for a long time. And I'm just interested, I really appreciate the conversation around um, you know, introducing children to ideas like interracial, queer, coupling, mm -hmm. questions of AIDS. I'm also wondering how to have conversations with kids. I don't know if that's, if there's a way that the book could be in a school curriculum or if there's a pedagogical approach to the book or if that's conversations that you're having with publisher, with the publisher, but um, I'd just be interested to think out, hear you think out loud about how to have these conversations with the children reading the books because I think thinking back to my experience there's there's like there can be misconceptions or misperceptions that come from introduction without more structure in some ways so. right that's an amazing question and you know I we were all set to go to Tucson and do a bunch of different school visits we were going to visit visit a detention center and present the book in all these different contexts and that was in March and we were supposed to fly on Wednesday and um, we realized we couldn't fly, I think two days before. So I haven't actually presented the book in a classroom, which I was really excited and nervous to do for these reasons, because I teach poetry in New York City public schools. And sometimes when I talk about the soul or the third eye or these exercises that I do, I see raised eyebrows in the back of the room from the teacher because you know, you're venturing onto these topics that um, feel complicated in terms of how you in, engage kids in this conversation. So I, I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm kind of excited to figure that out. To, I still haven't figured out exactly how to do it. Um, I would say with kids, though, is you share and listen. I mean, that, my first impulse is to say you, you listen to their questions and then respond to them. Um, and that's something that, yeah, I'm just really excited and a little nervous about. I would, I would guess with kids, it's maybe a little easier to discuss because as someone who's HIV positive and has experienced AIDS for many, many years, it's very hard to talk to adults about AIDS. It's very hard to tell someone that you're HIV positive without everything changing, the tone changing, it's getting very serious. And kids, I think, could be like, well, what's that? What and so there's a way to present it to them without it being... You know. Exactly. And also just to approach it, I think, in kind of a direct and somewhat matter of fact way. Exactly. Like, like the way that we've, we've just basically in the story just said, you know, Keith fell in love <laughs> and didn't sort of like create all this context around it, actually. And I think for some young readers, that's um, kind of exciting. Like it doesn't have to be an issue. It's just it sort of comes directly out of his story. But how the adults in the room are going to respond, like what the faces on the teachers in the back of the room, that's really interesting to me. But I think I knew that that was going to be complicated, and that's one of the challenges that I want to meet. And Adrian shared a comment, was thinking about seeing original herring. I've seen the one in Melbourne and the conversation around scale and public art and the particular movement and vibrancy of how his work explodes off of the building, also in keeping with the spirit of the book, the mural recently rehabilitated is on the side of a very queer inclusive school book, circus school book. Yes, school, sorry, not school book. <laughs> what a beautiful question or statement. What's the question? It's just, I was impressed <laughs> with the language. No, no, no question, just uh, sharing a thought that the conversation is bringing up a few things. Yeah. Well, one thing, one thing I forgot to mention earlier is that um, one of my favorite pieces is like 25 steps away from Greg and Donnie's bookstore. Yeah. And 
I just, if you haven't seen it, um, it's basically, you, anyone can walk into the center on 13th Street and walk up one flight of stairs and into what used to be the second floor bathroom, um, which now is a meditation space and the site of one of Keith's most incredible murals. And one of his, um, last, one of his final as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, think, I think there's a the story attached to it is that it was one of his favorite cruising spots the bathroom <laughs> i was, I was going to say that it actually was a great cruising spot before <laughs> <you know. laughs> so it's the mural fits the, the energy of the space absolutely perfectly yeah yeah now it's a temple says tyler t that's exactly that's it it's a temple you got it exactly right. yeah. i can't seem to get my chat thing to work but i just wanted to let matthew know the town where Keith is from is pronounced Kutztown, not Cutstown. It's Kutztown. I'm from <laughs> okay. that area. I grew up there. Um, I went to school there, actually. So it's pronounced Kutztown. <laughs> oh, did I say it incorrectly? Kutztown. Yes. Okay, Kutztown. Thank, you. thank you for that. Sure. And did you know Keith? Did he know Keith in Kutztown? No, I did not know him at all. He was younger than I. I do remember seeing his drawings in the subway, though. I never saw him work, but I remember seeing them um, on the subway. And what was your impression? My que I didn't have a question. I was just trying to let you know that Kutztown is pronounced Kutztown. <laughs> what was your impression of the Oh, my impression? Um, I liked them, but like Tom, I was into other things at the time. Um, I was traveling a lot. I was in fashion. Um, I was you know, not really in his milieu. Um, so I like them, but um, that's about it. And still do. Well, we're at seven o'clock. I don't know if, if there are any other um, questions, but I do want to say briefly that um, while you can order books from the Bureau right now, just by emailing us at contact at bgsqd.com. Um, right at this moment, we uh, are unable to order Matt's book. Um, you can order it directly from Enchanted Lion. So I included that in the event info, um, but I hope we'll be able to get uh, have copies soon um, and, uh, and send them directly to customers. So, if there are any books, um, other Keith Herring books that you're interested in and you'd like to buy them from the Bureau, we definitely appreciate it. Um, just email us at contact at bgsqd.com. Thank you, Greg and Donnie, so much for hosting us. And thank you, Tom, for joining. Thank you, Matthew. Thanks, Greg. Really you. And thanks for everyone who showed up. Thank you if, you haven't, if you haven't read Tom's book, read it. It's, yes, it's, it's beautiful. amazing. It's beautiful. Yeah. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks, everyone. I hope we'll get to see well, you in the flesh. Well, one day. Yeah, hug. <laughs> hug. <laughs> <laughs> hug your laptop. <laughs> and we'll post this. Thank you. We'll post this on YouTube. OK. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Thank Matt. You. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thanks, Jeffrey. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you, guys. It was Thank great. You. Thank you. Thanks, Erica. Bye. He saw me. <laughs>